Tayeh la boche katamaye. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. He katalabo. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your strength. He kolobo shiki a talabo se katabaye. He kolobo korda ta 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 la 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 ta ta ta. He lobo bobo korda mahashiki otoye. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Kutolo bo horda baba bardi ose. He kololo robo shiki a talala la 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 bo se. Why don't you just begin to worship him with understanding and with the spirit as well. In, in praying and thanksgiving tongues and also making thanksgiving with your understanding. In the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you, Father. We worship you, Lord. We adore you, O oh Lord, this day. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You reign forever and you shall reign forever more, O God. In the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, that's it. Just begin to worship him. It can be an understanding and it can be through the spirit. Let's just begin to worship him and thank him. He katalabo shekata. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for every good gift. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, my heart and flesh cry out for the living God. Thank you, Father. You are good, Father. You are good, Lord. You are good, Lord. You're still on the throne, O Lord. You're still in control, Lord. God, we depend on you, O Lord, this morning. You are the redeemer. You are a help. You are the provider. You are the shepherd, O Lord. We can depend on you. We can find strength and rest in you. We can find rest in the shepherd, O Lord, this morning. Thank you, 
I'm used to the Lord flowing through a very specific word. I don't like to make statements unless he's not the one making them. And this is a statement, but I feel like it's not a specific word. God will open up the volume of what's about to be spoken based on your hunger and your understanding for the word of God. Uh, I remember, I think it was about two or three years ago, there was a message preached, I think, about during camp meeting of 2020, if I'm not mistaken, or 2021. And the preacher said, the Lord spoke to him and said, tell these people, turn them loose. And he didn't understand what that meant. But he could just hear God saying, turn them, turn them loose. And what the Lord meant by that was what they feel in their spirit, what they feel that I'm speaking to them, let it just be turned loose and let them just flow. Don't, don't let them be restrained. And there, there's something in my spirit that I can feel the Lord. He's almost saying the exact same phrase turn them loose but it's almost like it's in a different way because when that man of God said turn them loose he was talking about the gifts of the spirit operating turn them loose let 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 the gifts of the spirit operate but I believe this church is mature in spiritual gifts we already know how to turn that loose what I, what I feel like God is saying right now, some of you, you have been maybe going through a, a trial or a season or a rough time in your life, and there's just something inside of you that just wants to cry out before God. There's some of you, you just want to weep before him. God's saying, that's okay, you can turn that loose. Because the Lord needs, knows you need the release that you're desiring after. Some of you, you have a spiritual hunger. And you may not necessarily be going through a rough season, but you're just hungry for God. God's saying, just turn that loose this morning. So if you're hurting and you just want to express your praise because you're so broken, God's saying, man. That's powerful. Something just came in this place right now. He cut But if you have a hunger for God, there, there's a scent of the Holy Ghost that just came in this place right now, just the presence of God. But if that's you, if, if you're just going through, some, some, there's sometimes the storms of life, I just want to cry out before God and just fall on my face and weep. And I feel like God's saying, you can do that. Turn it loose. I want to use your brokenness. I don't want to use the part of you that tries to be strong all the time. I want to use the broken part. I want to use the part that depends and needs me. So if you have a hunger or if you're just hurting and you just want God, God's saying, just turn that loose. 
it doesn't matter what it is if you want to weep before him if you want to worship before him it doesn't matter but can you just begin to turn that loose within you come on the presence of god just walked into this place there's a scent of the holy ghost i can i can feel that scent smell that scent of the spirit of god that just walked in in this place right now why don't you just begin to turn it loose right now in the name of jesus christ I want you, Jesus. I want you, Jesus. I want you, Jesus. Come on, between your hunger for Him. Why don't you just begin to turn it loose? Because of your hunger, because of your desire. Come on, that's it. Some of you are getting the release you need. Come on, I can feel angels walking in this place. Come on, you get the release you need. If you're dealing with baggage, God saying, just release it. If you're dealing with hurt, just release it. If you're dealing with stress, just release it. Turn it loose to God. Put it at His feet. Come on, you get what you need from God right now. Come on, you're getting the release you need right now. You're getting the peace that you need. That's it, mother, get the release that you need. That's it, sister. Get the release that you need. He korobo say, "Come on, I can hear the I can hear the Lord saying to someone right now, daughter, thy faith has made thee whole." He katarabo sata. I can hear the Lord saying that right now, daughter, thy faith has made thee whole in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, 
Come on, let your faith make you whole. God doesn't want you just to be healed. He wants you to be whole. Come on, that shade. Come on, that shade. God's doing something right now. God's working in the deep places right now. He God's transitioned us from shallow waters to deep waters right now. Shakataye. I'm just going to say it how the Lord is saying it to me. If you want to swim in deep waters, can you just make your way to the front? Deep waters in the spirit. A deep flow. no doubt what God's about to do. Come on, if you want to go to in a deep place with God, would you make your way to the front? There's some of you in, that are here that God is calling you and you haven't yet made that step. He has something for you. If there's that depth in the spirit, if you feel that tug, why don't you just begin to make your way to this altar? God's about to do something and you're not going to want to miss it. He His flow and his living water will fill and suffice every imperfect and broken place. It will fill in the cracks that are a product of a broken heart. It will mend it back together. It will fill the crooked and the broken places. My God. Word of prophecy is in this place for someone right now. My spirit. My spirit is upon you, saith the Lord, to mend the brokenhearted, to release captives, to recover the sight of the blind. My spirit is upon you, my people, saith the Lord. From this day forward, in the name of Jesus Christ, why don't you just begin to receive that word right now? Why don't you just begin to flow in that deep current? Why don't you just begin to explore this dimension right now? In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. Shakatale Bordokota. Hikatale Bordokosa. Hikatale Bordokote. Receive it right now in the name of Jesus. Receive that deep manifestation. Hikatale Bordokosa Katele Baha. 
he called up, come on, that's it, that's it, come on, the living water and the deep things of God and the deep movement of his spirit, it will fill that emptiness, it will fill that void in that broken place. Come on, the Spirit of God is moving. Like it did in the book of Genesis. It moved on the face of the deep. It moved upon the waters. And the Spirit of God moved. Before there was light, the Spirit of God moved. Come on, before there's light in your situation, the Spirit of God is going to move upon the face of the waters. You may not see the light yet, but the Spirit of God is moving upon the face of the deep. In the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ, someone receive that word right now. Somebody believe that word right now. Someone mix it with faith. In the name of Jesus. I want you to hear me in the Holy Ghost for just a moment. I feel like we sometimes overlook, just stay where you are, I feel like we sometimes overlook scripture because we predetermine in our minds, we already know what the contents are. We read certain books and say, oh, that's not one of the gospels, I'm not going to receive as much revelation, or that's just Exodus, that's just Genesis. With the word of God, every scripture is profitable for doctrine. Every scripture has revelation. And it's interesting. It's, it's the first book of the Bible, the first chapter says, and, and I'm sure we're all familiar with this. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without void, form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. That kind of sounds like some of our lives. Dark and it's void. There's an emptiness in here. But it's interesting before. Okay, Lord. Before it ever says and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse 2, the latter portion says, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. There's a prophetic word for someone right now. God is moving upon the face of the waters of your life. And he's about to speak light and life after he moves upon the face of the waters of your life. And so it may be dark and it may be void. But if the spirit of God is moving in your life, get ready because he's about to speak. Let there be light in my child's situation. Let, let, let there be light in their eyes. Come on, someone needs to receive that right now. He's moving upon the face of the waters, but God's saying, 
You're satisfied with a movement, but I'm going to speak something. I'm going to speak light. I'm going to speak life. Come on, in the name of Jesus Christ. If you believe that, why don't you just begin to germinate it in your spirit? And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. We stop at the move of God. But God's move was only the beginning of what he was going to do. Because he still had a logos that became rhema. And the rhema was, let there be light. And there was light. God's about to speak to some of you right now and he's about to command light because he's about to speak it because he's just moved upon the face of the waters in the name of Jesus Christ if you believe that right now why don't you just begin to mix it with faith if you believe that right now why don't you just begin to mix it with faith it's your word it's your word. God says, let there be light on that campus because I'm moving inside of them. Let there be light in their city because my spirit is moving upon them. Let there be light. Halabosataya. Musicians, you can come, but why don't we just keep on praying right now? Why don't you just begin to pray in the spirit? God's about to do something apostolic right now. God's about to release something like Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. God's saying, let there be light. I'm going to release something. It may be dark in your situation, but I'm about to command light to break forth like the morning. And you're going to see something new. I wonder if you could just begin to let out the loudest shout unto God with the voice of triumph, with the voice of gladness. Come on, why don't you just begin to stand to your feet right now and worship the Lord. Why don't you just begin to let that rhema speak. Let there be light. Let there be light in this situation. Let there be light.
Somebody dance unto my the Lord. My dance will be my weapon. Hallelujah. My, my dance, dance will be my weapon. Yes. My dance will be my weapon. 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 My dance
Would you pray for somebody right now? In Jesus' name. Begin to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Ghost. For the presence of God is here. Begin to be sensitive to what people are going through. And together you are stronger in Jesus' name. Together, as the body of Christ, the anointing is multiplied. The presence of God is obligated by His Word. Where two or three are gathered, He will show up. Hallelujah. Somebody no right shadow, now in Jesus name. No valley, where you find me, no in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, before me, before behind me. me. He goes before you like a pillar of cloud. No shadow, in the morning, the no shield. Valley, he goes before you as a pillar of fire in the darkness. No Always be Let the presence me, of God no minister shadow, to you right now. No valley, the presence of the Lord is here. You won't find me. is moving in this place. Be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Ghost. And just begin to flow in the presence of God. Let Him touch parts of your being that have not ever been open to. Let it be open to the presence of the Lord. Always Jesus. Behind me, always beside me, no shadow, no valley. In the name of Where Jesus. You won't find me. Lord. No, I am not afraid. Before me, behind me, always beside me, no shadow, no valley. Where you won't That's find right. Let the me, presence no, of the Lord bless you. I 
you've never been Be in the spirit. Me. takes it all together me, the mistakes and the things me, that you have done right God takes it all together me, no shadow, and he makes it beautiful no valley, he makes it to work me, for the good in the name of Jesus afraid. so you could have confidence in him you could have boldness in him is the one that has been leading all this time directing all this time in the name of Jesus Christ in the name of Jesus Christ yeah, there's nothing like the flow of the presence of God there's nothing like the flow of the presence of the Lord in the name of Jesus Christ in the name of Jesus Christ it washes, it cleanses, it heals. That's right, just keep flowing with the Holy Ghost. As long as He's flowing, just flow with it. As long as He's talking to you, just keep listening. Just have it minister to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I will not be afraid. pillar of cloud that covers you, that 
pillar of cloud that is miraculous all by itself. A physical manifestation of the presence of God that could be seen, that could be touched, that gives clarity, that gives assurance and meaning that God is there. And He has not left you, but He is there as an ever-present help in all kinds of situations, both the highs and the lows of life. He is there as a shield. He goes before you. He goes behind you. He's all around you like a hedge. Around and the top. Around and at the bottom. He covers you. He is your covering. And I will not be afraid. And he goes as a pillar of fire in the nighttime. When things seem dark, when you cannot see as far and as clear as it is in the day, but the pillar is there. It's fire in the evening because fire repels. Fire, fire repels the beasts of the night that come to devour, that come to steal, that come to kill. The fire of the Lord is there to protect before you, behind you all around you it illuminates it gives warmth it protects it's the seal of the Lord that is upon you an expression of this God that we love and serve that he says I'm here I'm here it's not like fire in the sword of the angel that was in the garden right at the beginning that protects the tree of life and it protects that life in you that God has given you even life forevermore that fire keep that fire burning fan that flame in your soul do whatever you need to do to keep that ember burning inside to be red hot for him to be lukewarm but to be red hot for the gospel for the kingdom for the work that God has called you to be for the child that you are in the name of Jesus Christ as we sing that one more time would you just begin to believe the God that is behind you and before you in the name of Jesus Christ
me that perfect no love. shadow, no valley. Mature love. Where you won't find Cast it out. Because fear is torment. But the love of God casteth out all fear. Has fear left, uncertainty left your soul this morning? Do you feel the assurance, the love of God? In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. Would you cast your cares unto Him? He cares for you. He loves you. In the name of Jesus Christ. It is good to be in the presence of God this morning. Hallelujah. You can be seated if you want, but we are in the presence of the Lord. Have you sensed the presence of the Lord in this place? Caleb was walking among the people of God. The people of God that was delivered out of Egypt. Joshua and Caleb were slaves. In Egypt, Egypt is a type of this temporary worldly system of government that we are in. And their speech growing up was affected by their surroundings. It was affected by how they were brought up. It was affected by their condition of being slaves. It was a hard condition. Can you picture it in your mind? Of being beaten to make brick to do construction work and construction work those of you that know it's a hard job it, it wears on your body but if you get paid and you get paid good at least there's some form of relief but in their situation they, they were slaves they were not paid at all they were Given just enough food to survive. Given just enough so they won't die and this free labor will continue to, to serve Pharaoh. And because of that, when you're in that situation, your, your speech gets affected. Amen? In fact, all of us, whatever our situation is, what we say, is affected by those conditions, whatever they may be. If you're full of victory, your surroundings, your present condition is conducive or you like it, then your speech changes. It's full of hope, full of anticipation, full of strength and victories. But when your situation changes and there's some uncertainties, then your speech begins to change it begins to be not as positive not as anticipating something that's good and that, that's part of our human nature but the Lord is saying to us today that this is just a temporary dimension your future is not dictated by what you're going through or not going through today your future, you are hid. Your life is hid in Christ. And God has plans for you as His body, as His people, as His children. And the Lord is saying to us today, don't allow your present situations to affect your speech to the point where you say it out loud. There's a difference between thinking it and saying it. Amen? Amen? You can keep playing, brother. I think you're going to be there for a while. And it sounds good. Amen. Thank you. But it begins to change. You could think thoughts. And if it stays that way, if you don't voice it out, it does not affect the atmosphere. Does that make sense? You could go through struggles. I mean, you could speak it, but you need to speak it not out of frustration, but in prayer. 
casting your cares unto the Lord because He cares for you. That's acceptable. But, but to release it in the atmosphere of your life, it, it changes things because your voice has the power to affect the atmosphere. Not just yourself, but the people around you. And we know this for a fact because if we gather together and we begin to speak negative things, it, it affects everybody. Amen? But when you begin to speak about the goodness of God and the power of God and the blessings of the Lord and the angels that encamp round about you that love Him and fear Him, it begins to change the atmosphere. It just elevates it to the realm of the supernatural. And those of you that are using the gifts of the Spirit, don't allow what you say in the Holy Ghost to be influenced by your present circumstances or what you know about certain people. You speak what the Lord gives you and only what the Lord gives you. You don't have to logically figure it out. You just speak it. And the Word, <coughs> excuse me, will not return void. It will not return empty. It will accomplish what... There's power here today. How many you sense? There's, there's anointing here that I sense in the Holy Ghost hovering above us. It's hovering above you. Why don't you lift up your hands and just ask God, Lord, I want to sense this atmosphere, this presence of God that is here that's hovering above me, oh God. And I want, oh Lord... I want it, oh God, to, to begin to affect the atmosphere in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. It's hovering. The story of Peter and the Lord Jesus Christ when he was in a boat and they were experienced fishermen. Right? Don't you agree? I think over two-thirds or 80 percent of them were fishermen so when they got in the boat the first time the Lord was in the boat and there was a storm and they woke Jesus up and everything was good the second time the Lord was not in the boat they were by themselves and the Bible says the waves were contrary and they feared for their life now there's it's one thing for you and I that are not experienced fishermen, you know, to be in a, some sort of a boat and think, you know, hey, this is a bad storm. It might. But, but for them to be afraid, being experienced fishermen, it was a very dire circumstance. And, and you know, when, you, when you're in that situation, it affects your perception. Uh, I don't know if you've been in a, an ocean when it's just pitch dark, you can't even see your hand in front of you. My dad used to have a fishing boat business, and when I was younger, I'd go out with them. And it was, they go out for months and never see land. they just fish and catch. But when you're out in the ocean, you begin to see things. Right? That's why you got myths of mermaids. Ever seen a mermaid? There's a there's a there's an animal I can't remember what it is. Uh, it's not a. Oh, it slipped my mind. It looks like a pilot whale, but from a distance it actually looks like a person. Hmm? No, not a walrus. It's it's a. I can't remember what it is. It, it looks like a walrus. It always looks like a, a, a trunk of an elephant. But you begin to see things. And if you remember this story, they began to see Jesus walking on the water. And they said, it's a omen. They didn't recognize it. Myths that have been in their culture began to play in their mind. And even though it was the Lord, they perceived it to be a threat. And sometimes when we go through things, we can't see so clearly it is God that is walking on the water hallelujah 
And then Peter, who was given the keys to the kingdom and eventually preached on the day of Pentecost, being baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. And Polita's here, and she's going to get baptized in Jesus' name. Amen. Later on, thank God. And I hear you. I see you. Amen. And then we're going to see the Lord. The Lord actually said, be not afraid. It is I. Sometimes God tells us, hey, I'm involved, I'm here. But we don't really believe it. Or at least our faith hasn't caught up yet to where we're fully convinced. And Peter said, if it be thee. So he was not convinced. God already said it's me. But their culture worked against them. Their perception, the storms. It just blurs their vision. He said, if it's you, bid me to come to thee on the water. Right? And the Lord says, one word, come. Sometimes we want a narration and sometimes the rhema is that. Sometimes we want an explanation and sometimes in the goodness of God, he does explain. But usually situations where he begins to build up your most holy faith as you pray in the Holy Ghost he gives you one word he gives you the word come in other words progress keep walking keep walking because you're already in your miracle you're not going to get to your miracle you are already walking in your miracle in fact you are in your miracle right now does anybody want to believe that that you are in your miracle right now this very moment you are in your miracle the miracle was they didn't capsize the miracle was they didn't even believe that it was Jesus but they still heard his voice Sometimes we think it should be so clear and our mind plays tricks on us. Is it God? It is God. You have the Holy Ghost. Thoughts implanted to you. At some point, God's going to reveal if it is His voice or not. And He tells him, come or hover. Hover above the waves, above the situation. Hover. Ever seen a hovercraft? It just kind of elevates itself off of the land. It just hovers. The Lord was walking on the water, but He's not walking on the waves. Are you with me? He's not balancing like in a surfboard or on the boat that's rocking. No, He's hovering over the water it's the same in the book of Genesis in the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters he just hovered on top of it and there's creative power there and God's inviting us today because you're already in your miracle just to hover in Jesus name with him hover with him walk in your miracle keep walking in your miracle and hover because there's creative power here there's an atmosphere here of the miraculous. Would you grab it in Jesus' name? It's an atmosphere that's ingested. It's an atmosphere that is breathed into you. And you keep walking. You keep walking in your miracles. Somebody begin to worship the Lord right now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, would you begin to worship and begin to change the atmosphere of your life. Begin to change the atmosphere, the condition of your circumstances by just simply walking in your miracle and hovering over the circumstances knowing that God, who is the creator, is creating things. Hallelujah. The beauty of that story is that sometimes even as you walk or keep walking in the miracle, 
You get distracted. How many of you realize you are a miracle? You're a miracle. The things that have happened in your life is not a coincidence. God has kept you. God has preserved you. God has put a hedge around you. God has preserved your life. You're a miracle. You are in you. You're not getting to your miracle. You are in your miracle. You are living your miracle. But as Peter took his eyes off the Lord, began to look at the waves that they were boisterous, he began to sink. And the Bible says immediately. Someone say immediately. The Lord reached out and pulled him. Immediately. Somebody receive that word right now, immediately. God's going to do an immediate work. God's going to change your emotions, your circumstances, your perception. Oh, your, per your circumstances may not fully change, but your perception becomes your reality. And then everything changes. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. When you read stories like that, it is not a wonder that Jesus, with all the things that Peter did not have or lacked, no wonder he chose him to preach on the day of Pentecost, to repent, to be baptized in Jesus' name, and to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Because as the other disciples were safely in the boat, watching to see what happens, he was the only one that hovered. I'm pretty sure it never left his mind. I'm pretty sure that experience changed him and gave him boldness. I'm pretty sure at the lowest part of his life, he said, you know what? All things will work together for the good. Because I love God and I'm called according to his purpose. I'm pretty sure those experiences he had, and you and I have those same experiences. You've hovered over things that your thought's going to sink you. And yet, here you are. I'm still standing. I'm still walking. I'm still alive. The promises of God are still true. In the name of Jesus, somebody begin to lift up your faith. Somebody begin to build up your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. So tell somebody, you're not walking into your miracle. You are in your miracle. You're not getting there. You are there. And so you just keep walking. Keep experiencing. Keep exploring in Jesus' name. You know, Caleb, he was in Egypt and he was beaten down with the burdens and sometimes the repetition of the day kind of wears you down, right? You, woke, you wake up, you go to work, you fight the traffic. And, you know, after being in the Philippines, there's no traffic here. When you, have to when, you, when you have to travel two miles and it takes you 45 minutes, you're thankful for the freeway systems in the United States. It's just, there were some days I said, you know what, I'm just going to walk. But then you look at the pedestrians don't have the right of way. You say, you know, I'll get there closer or sooner, but I might die in the process. Because it's just amazing how how life is over there. But don't let the mundane things, the repetition of things, don't, don't let it rob you of your faith. Because God, God's always at work. He's, you're always progressing. If you think about creation, everything's moving. Nothing is static. 
everything because everything that's alive is moving even this, this plexiglass right here the molecules inside there they're moving everything's moving because there's always progress in God there's always movement in God and so don't be tempted to think you know what that it seems like no nothing's happening and because it's just a repetition of day in day out things now you're closer than you've ever been to your inheritance Hallelujah. yes we're closer than ever been. Oh, I could taste it. I could taste my inheritance. I could almost see that streets of gold. I could almost see my father welcoming, waiting. Well done. In Jesus' name. And the challenge is this. As you keep walking, not to let your speech get affected. The people in Egypt that were freed. And, and Egypt is a type and shadow of our walk with God. And they witnessed 10 notable miracles. Right? Moses had 10 notable miracles that eventually led to Pharaoh letting the people go. Which is interesting to me because... The Bible tells us that there's no greater prophet than John the Baptist, born of a woman, than John the Baptist, right? Is that what Jesus said? But yet, there, there were no visible miracles. There were no, there certainly there was not, no fire from heaven like Elijah. There was no hail. There was no death angel that passed over like Moses. But yet, he was the greatest prophet, the Bible said. Which just lets us know God's perception is so different than ours. And then he says this. The least in the kingdom. This kingdom. People are baptized in Jesus' name. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Is greater than John. Well, I don't know if you caught that. But that's how God sees you. That's how God sees His church, His bride, His children, His sons and daughters. Amen. That you are greater than John the Baptist. In fact, if you study the book of Revelation, you're going to sit on thrones. They are not. They're standing. You're sitting down. You're going to have crowns on your head. Then they're not. You're going to rule and reign with Him forever. And they're not to that least that degree. The Bible says we're going to take our crowns and cast it on His feet. And we're going to worship Him, the one who died. The one who has nails, scarred hands and pierced through His side where blood and water came out. Because the first will be last. The last will be first. But to whom much is given, much is required. You don't want to be lost in this dispensation. You want to make it. Because the offer of God is tremendous. And it's going to be a tremendous journey with Him. The Old Testament, as God delivered them from Egypt, is a type and shadow of things to come. And the greatest one was the one is the death angel that passed over them. The judgment of the Lord, which I believe mirrors the great tribulation that's going to pass over us we're not going to go through it because the blood is applied he sees the doorpost of your life the entrance into your being and you're baptized in Jesus name and he sees the blood because that's how the blood is applied through the baptism through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and we're going to leave this place with a high outstretched hand just like they did in Egypt the Bible says, borrow jewels, borrow precious things from your neighbors. And they spoiled Egypt, the Bible says, when God delivered them. See, when the rapture gets closer and closer, you and I that are prepared to be laborers, it will be the most exciting life you will live. You won't be working your secular job. You'll be putting the kingdom first. You'll be preaching, sharing Jesus, the gospel. 
You'll see people be filled with the Holy Ghost. You'll see people healed. You'll experience the supernatural because right now you're getting acquainted with your miracle and you're simply walking in it as God leads you to higher heights. Exodus 6, verse 6, Wherefore say unto the lighthouse, unto the children of Israel, unto the people of God, I am the Lord. That title of God, I am. The great I am. I am before time. I am the infinite God. I, not I was or I will be. I am. I am ever present help. I am there because he's infinite. I am the Lord and I will. These are seven, if you would, promises of God to the church. And he says, I will. Or my will is and it will be. There's seven of them. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Somebody thank him for that. I will rid you out of their bondage. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgment. I will take you for me, to me for a people. I will be to you a God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. Verse 8, and I will bring you into the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it you for an inheritance did I lose you I am the Lord he said I'll bring you into the land you know what it symbolizes it's the promised land it's heaven he will he will you will be saved I will hallelujah Praise God. And he says, I will give it to you for our inheritance. A heritage. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. Would you just worship him right now in Jesus' name? Come on, would you just worship him right now? In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Would you believe that right now that he will? When God promises he keeps his word. I will bring you out from the burdens of this world. I will rid you of the struggles, your bondages. I will redeem you with a stretched out, miraculous, strong hand. Like I did with the Egyptians. I will take you to me for a people. You're a child of God. I will be to you a God. In Jesus' name, I will bring you into the land that he promised. And I will give to you for a heritage. I am the Lord. But sometimes here's, here's where we get stuck in verse 9. That Moses spake so unto the children of Israel. And so Moses told them this seven I wills of the Lord. But they hearken not unto Moses for, and this is the reason, for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. Their situation overrode the promises of God and the voice of God. Don't let that happen to you. Kind of like that man that says, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Do not express your fears in words. Because here's what the truth is. When God delivers you, he always gives you more than what you started with. There is a process, but he always gives you more. In Exodus 12, verse 35, and the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses. And they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver, gold, raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. So they lent unto them such things as they required. And they spoiled the Egyptians. 
when you leave this world, when the rapture happens, we're not going to leave with a whimper. We're not going to barely make it. We're going to leave with a stretched arm. arm. We're going to leave with power. We're going to leave with authority. In fact, it will spoil this world, not in riches, but in souls that will be spoiled from the kingdom of the devil. But don't, while you're working and walking in your miracle, don't let it affect your words. Don't let it affect what you say out loud in this generation, the younger one. You should know that, right? Out loud. Like LOL, right? Laugh out loud. Amen. In Deuteronomy 7, verse 17, If thou shalt say in thy heart, These nations are more than I, how can I dispossess them? Thou shalt not be afraid of them. Thou shalt well remember what the Lord God did unto Pharaoh, unto all Egypt. Can you remember the victories that you have? Can you remember the miracles that God has given you? The great temptation which Danine saw in the signs and the wonders. And the stretched out arm whereby the Lord thy God brought thee out, so shall the Lord thy God do unto all these of whom thou art afraid. You know, fear is your enemy. The, the fear of the Lord is not fearing God, but it's, it's reverence, respecting God. But when you fear circumstances, when you fear people, when you fear anything that's in this dimension, it's your enemy. It, it doesn't matter what it is. Amen? You, you, you cannot fear what man can do unto you. Or what the natural things can do unto you. You see, there's a difference when it's just in your heart. And it's it's in your thoughts. It's elevated when you speak it. And the ten spies in Numbers 13. The, the ten spies were... Since, since God already knows what they were going to say. He did not judge them until they said it. Does that make sense? So, so God sent them to spy the land. But God knew what they were going to say. But He did not judge them until they said it. Because there's a difference between you and I thinking things, thinking fear and speaking it. That's why sometimes the greatest battle that you and I have is when you lay up and stay up at night and, and your flesh and your adversary just wants you to get to say out loud your fears or what you're going through. That's when you fight it. That's when you fight it. That's when you let the Holy Ghost inside of you begin to speak faith in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome. But the men that went with him said, They said it, We be not able to go up against the people, for they're stronger than we. And the Bible calls it in verse 32, an evil report. See, there are things we say, but if it's contrary to the will of God, to what already said, that you're going to possess the land, and say we can't, it's just not a negative statement. It's an evil report in the sight of God. If the Lord told you He's going to save your family, and you say it out loud, well, maybe they're not going to get baptized. That's an evil report. Or you could think it, you could battle it in your mind, but don't speak it in Jesus' name. Would you begin to speak faith right now that your family, your sons, your daughters, your mother, your father, I don't care how bleak the situation may be. You can say and counter what you have said in the past. And you can say it today in the atmosphere of faith and say they will be saved. They will repent. They will
will be baptized in the name of Jesus and they will be filled with the Holy Ghost and they will be laborers in the kingdom. See, you could counter what you've said before and cancel it. It's called repentance. Amen? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say or speak unto this mountain and it shall move. See, they saw themselves. They said, there's giants there. There's men of great stature. And Caleb spoke up again in Numbers 14. It nearly cost him his life. Did you know that? In verse 9, he says, Only will not against the will, against the Lord. Neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. What a perception. All the ten, they all saw the same thing, but yet Caleb, Caleb and Joshua, he had a different perception. They saw giants. He said, man, we're going to eat them for breakfast. Amen? <laughs> that's, that's a modern-day vernacular. It, it's not new. They just said it differently. He said, they're bread for us. Man, we're going to eat them alive. Their defense is departed from them. And the Lord is with us. Fear them not. <laughs> I feel faith in the house. I feel faith rising as you continue to walk in your miracle. Nearly cost him his life, verse 10, but all the congregation bade stone them with stones. But God protects his people and the glory of the Lord appeared. Like that fire, like that pillar of cloud. God showed up. Because when you're in danger, God shows up. But are you realizing it? He just shows up. Because he's, well, not that he shows up. Because he's always been there, right? Right? Because he's infinite, he's everywhere. Time doesn't matter to him. So how can you show up if everything is in you? The universe is contained in you. You can't show up. You know what happens? We just perceived him to be there because he's already been there. He's always present. And then, see, see, this is where we need to be careful what we say and, and thank God for repentance because you could say something different that cancels what you said in fear. And God began to pronounce judgment. He said, 20 years and older, you're not going to make it. You're going to die in the wilderness. And, and the 20 days, the 40 days rather, that you went spying the land, I'll count it as one year. Because a day unto the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years unto a day, right? And God was merciful. It won't be 40,000 years. Then Caleb would die as well. So he said it'll be 40 years. You'll wander in the desert. And they changed what they said in Numbers 14, verse 40. Because in, in, in Numbers 14, verse 28, say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as you have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. And he said, Your carcasses, in verse 29, shall fall in the wilderness. And all that were numbered of you according to your whole number. So God's a mathematician. Did you know that? There's whole numbers, there's prime numbers, there's integers, there's going back to my engineering days. That just, just jumped out of me. Whole number. From 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless you shall not come into the land, which I swear to you to make you dwell, accept or save. Are you with me, sis? Keep up with me, please. Save Caleb, the son of Joshua. Excuse me, the son of Jephthah and Joshua, the son of Nun. After the number of the days in which you searched the land, even 40 days, each day of 40 years, you shall bear your iniquities. Even 40 years you shall know my breach of promise. It's very important that we believe the promises of God, the promise of growth. Of fruitfulness. Amen. Those of you that are going outreach, 
Don't let it be mechanical and you're not expecting something. Hello, somebody. Why don't you just lift up your hands right now, those you are actively going out and say, God, I believe your promise. I'm walking in my miracle and I'm going to expect fruit, oh Lord. I'm going to expect people to come. I'm going to expect that you're going to lead me as I become sensitive to your voice. Would you pray that prayer right now that you become sensitive to the voice of God, that you're sensitive enough to his voice where he leads you to somebody that's hungry. Somebody's looking for him in the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody thank him that he is going to give you a sensitivity. He is going to give you a sensitivity to his voice. In fact, he's been working on that for a while. And now you're ready. So I say, I'm ready. You're ready. Amen. Numbers 14, they, verse 40, they, they, they changed what they said. But because they are not in the dispensation that you and I live. They were not granted the privilege of repentance like you and I have. And then he said, they rose up early. He got up to the mountain. And said, lo, we be here and we will go up unto the place which the Lord promised. For we have sinned. So they repented. Right? And Moses said, Wherefore do now do you transgress the commandment of the Lord, but it shall not prosper. Go not up, for the Lord is not among you, that you be not smitten before your enemies. They changed their words. They voiced it out. But they're not in the dispensation of empowerment or grace like you and I have. Thank God for our dispensation. Thank God for what we have said that we should not have said. And then in the mercy of the Lord, He changes it because of this dispensation. Some of you don't believe that. You want proof? You want scripture? Didn't Peter deny Jesus Christ three times? Right? Did he say it out loud? Yes, he did, right? Did he preach on the day of Pentecost? Did God forgive him? Hallelujah. You know how? God reversed it when he asked him, Lovest thou me, Peter? Three times. Three times. He denied him three times. God the Lord, in his mercy and his love, asked him three times. Reverses what he said. Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Lovest thou me, Peter? God, you know I filial you to feed my lambs ask him the third time lovest thou me Peter and the Bible says he was grieved in his heart because at that point he cannot love him unconditionally he says Lord thou knowest all things he says feed my sheep he reverses he catalamos o y calle alaso. Somebody begin to worship him of all the times that God has reversed the things in our lives. Oh, the love and the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. The miracle that you are, the miracle that you're walking in and to keep walking. Oh, I wonder if there's somebody that's truly grateful for the forgiveness of the Lord upon your life. And you just want to express it and say, Father, thank you for reversing things in my life. Thank you, Lord, for overlooking my flesh. Thank you for looking, overlooking my personality and my tendencies. I am a miracle. And I'll keep walking in my miracle in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to get, get it all perfect to keep walking in your miracle. How many believe God is still good whether we are good or not in our own estimation? Man, that's why we cannot boast of our own righteousness. Consider this in Deuteronomy 29 verse 5. And the Lord said, I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes are not waxing old upon you. 
and thy shoe is not waxen old upon thy foot. You could also read it here. Their clothes grew with them. Their shoes grew with them. Because in the wilderness, they had sons and daughters. They had people born. And the Bible says, in the heat of the desert and in the dust of the, of the ground, it didn't grow old. Even in their state of disobedience they were still walking in their bed how much more you and I covered by the blood how much more you and I baptized in his name and filled with his own spirit that you are walking and are in your miracle is it changing your perception right now uh, is it helping your faith is it building your faith God is doing this for a reason because he's going to do a miracle in your life this morning in the name of Jesus Christ now these are great significant meaning that I don't have time to go into but their clothes is a covering it's a type of a covering and their shoes is a type of peace and they were all able to walk in this wilderness, especially those that were going to be saved and enter into the promised land with a covering, protection, authority, and with peace. Can you imagine walking for 40 years with peace? In a desert? You may not be able to imagine that, but the truth is you're living that because... I think the majority of us are 40 years and older here, right? Some almost times two. And you've been walking with the Lord. How many have walked with Him for more than 40 years? Can I see your hand? You've served God. God has lived through you more than 40 years. Praise God. Praise God. They kept walking. Every day, it was a miracle. Every day. I don't know if they realize it or not that their shoes just doesn't get old. Their clothes just doesn't seem to wear out. It still fits them as they grew and their children. Hallelujah. Nehemiah 9 verse 19 gives us another glimpse by the prophet. Yet thou in thy manifold mercies forsook them not in the wilderness. Praise God. When the devil tries to condemn you, when your circumstances try to envelope you, you remember this, in the manifold mercies of the Lord, He's not going to forsake you. In your lowest point in your experience, in your life, in your own wilderness, the pillar of the cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way where they were in they should go. God was still leading them. Can you thank Him for His mercy to us more? He's still leading them. Still leading them. The cloud covering, the fire. Thou gave us also Thy good spirit to instruct them. It is a type and shadow of the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And withheld us not Thy manna. If you need something to eat, God will supply it to you. Amen. If you need physical things, they're just things. All these things that the Gentiles seek after, God will give it to you, your Father. Give them water. And we know in the New Testament that the rock that followed them, where water gushed out, that rock was Christ Jesus. Followed them. Followed them. Yea, 40 years didst thou sustain them in the wilderness so that they lack. He will supply all your needs according to His riches and glory. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack anything. I shall not want. Somebody believe that right now. Come on, would you believe that right now? God wants to elevate your faith to the realm of the supernatural so you will have your own miracles and you will experience them for yourself and it will lift your faith and it will never be the same. Their clothes wax not old and their field feet swell not. 
the size of their shoe did not restrict the growth of their foot. And it didn't swell. Because if your shoe is smaller than your foot, it'll make your feet swell. It'll hurt after a while. So their shoes grew with them. I mean, what that kind of shoe? <laughs> Praise God. I'm, I'm just, I just have enough simple faith to believe that if God did it for them, He could do that today. If the Lord will, He'll give you shoes to grow with you. I know some of us won't grow anymore, but I guess for the end. Amen. How many want to believe that? How many want to believe you could still hover over the water? How many believe God could still feed thousands? Amen. And heal the blind and heal the deaf and heal the paralyzed people and take up their bed and walk. In verse 22, he says, Moreover, thou gavest them kingdoms and nations, and thou didst divide them into the corners so they possessed the land of Sihon the land of the king of Heshbon and the land of Og some say Og don't ever name your kid Og probably name your dog cat amen but not your kid Og of Bashan you know who Og is Og was a giant the king of Og excuse me Og is his name and he, uh, he was over 60 fortified cities and so when God eventually overcame and, and, and through the battles through Joshua they, they conquered the land of Og which was 60 fortified cities you know when I came here in the United States the thing that stood out to me the first thing was the houses didn't have any fence around them and I go wow that's not that's, that seems not safe because over there we had fences we had barbed wires and some of electric fence. And you got dogs, Dobermans, and shepherds, amen, to protect you. But here it's like, but back then, there were fortified cities in the northern regions, in the east of the Jordan River. And did you know Og was the last of the Rephaims? I think that's how you called it. They're the descendants of the, the lineage of the giants. And, and, and the Bible records in and I don't have this, but I think it's in Deuteronomy 13, verse 11, that his, his, his bed was 13 feet long. 13 feet long. So the chair, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that chair is probably, I don't know, 10 feet maybe, right? Probably 10 feet. So you add another, so all the way to the aisle right here. From, from that end all the way to this aisle so from that end where Sister Chica is all the way up to here that's how long his bed is no wonder they were afraid right because there were people that are this big walking around and they're not you know they're not skinny lethargic like some of the NBA players you talk about people that are, they're men of war wow. it, it, Goliath his, his coat of mail was 150 pounds could you imagine your coat you're walking around just just your coat not counting you know your pants and shoes or whatever it's 150 pounds and to him it's like like this you know like like a pound a couple pounds wow. these guys are massive they, these are warriors the bible says his, his bed is 13 feet long and it's six feet uh, wide, and we kind of know that because some of you live uh, s uh, swim in your bed there and go out six feet, so I'm probably up to here, right? The California king, I think, is six feet wide, amen. But but you're no giant. But God is saying to them, I'm gonna divide to you the things that you think you cannot handle. The things that you stares at you and mocks you and it's bigger than you. He said, I'm going to divide their corners. I'm just going to slash them and cut them into bite-sized pieces and give it to my children. Just like Caleb said, they're bread to us. Eventually that word was fulfilled. 
they ate them up in Jesus name why because they believed the word of God and they kept on walking in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ brother Edwin why don't you testify what, what you told me with Edwin's two testimonies uh, one was what he experienced Wednesday, the healing. And, and two, I'll let him tell you the, the hand of protection, that insurmountable giant that he was facing for a while that was wearing him out. And, and this past weekend, I believe it was God, God delivered him, delivered him to his hand. You look good, by the way. Go Thank ahead, you. brother. Jesus. I think you look better. <laughs> well, and praise God. Praise God. I'm, I'm just grateful that I'm alive right now, really. To give a little bit of backstory, um, my whole my whole battalion went doing exercises, 29 palms, I stayed back, I was injured, I was recovering, right, and I managed to get, I managed to grow closer to God, and I managed to grow more in the spirit during that entire time, and when other brothers and other sisters were praying for me, they, they kept, like, I kept on hearing one thing, there's going to be trials coming your way. And there's going to be opposition to what you want to do with Camp Pendleton. And I started thinking to myself, like, what could that be? And everyone, everyone just came back from 29. They changed, like, the, the way our teams are. So now I will, um, they put a brand new corporal above me. And... For the most part, we were basically mistreated, right? Like, I could barely run. Like, he, he forced me. He didn't carry, didn't want to hear what I had to say about anything. Because in his eyes, I didn't know nothing. So, that's how it was for like two weeks. And... I was fed up with it, right? For the first time in a long time, I, I, I like, I experienced deep anger, and that was just confusing for me. I didn't know how to react to it. I felt like I lost my peace, and I could not regain it back. So, I've been, I've been talking and praying with Sister Lachik about this for a week now. And my mom as well. And they've both been telling me the same thing. Just cast your cares upon the Lord and whatever he wants, let it happen. And I was like, okay, I guess I'll just do that. And this past Wednesday, while in the same prayer that, that I was praying uh, for my healing, I was like, Lord, I'm going to cast my cares in all my feelings that I have towards this man onto you. And before the service ended, the pastor basically confirmed what has uh, what I've been hearing for a while that, that there's something big coming and it's going to mess with me mentally and emotionally. Right, the church prayed for me, and the next day, on Thursday, it was this week, right? This past Thursday, we had a we have a twenty we had a twenty mile hike coming. So they basically text me saying, "Hey, get in front of this room. We just want to make sure you're here." And I'm over here like, man, this is too early for this. So I change immediately, go out there, and I see my friend. Just, just start getting blasted about how horrible of a Marine he is. And basically, him just being degraded. 
and he had enough at this point so he started lashing out he started cursing him out threatening him as well and I was just standing there like I'm not I'm not gonna get myself involved with this I'm not gonna protect either of them because first of all this man's not gonna want to listen to me and also he hates me and I believe he hates me so he wouldn't want to hear what I had to say to begin with so he stormed off my friend stormed off and I was like morning corporal you need anything from me it was like just fix that man and when they say fix him they always mean like usually like go beat him up right make sure he doesn't do this again and in my head I'm like I'm not gonna do that I'm gonna go talk to him something that this man has never done to me he has never talked to me one-on-one -on -one. he said fix him or else everyone else is gonna pay so I started walking back to his room and I could hear him still screaming in anger He's banging the door, throwing everything. And I'm like three feet away from his door, about to open it up and to talk to him. And all I hear is him um, loading up a gun. And I, I didn't think twice. I just ripped open the door and I looked at him and I was, and I was like, what are you doing? As I see my friend, who's also his roommate, she like already wrestling for the gun and I quickly join in I'm right in front of him and at this point he has his hand free so he's trying he's still trying to wrestle out of it and I'm over here trying to talk him down like hey I don't like this man at all but this is not the way we, we gotta we gotta do things man and I told him I've already have enough I've already I've already been to enough funerals, man. I don't want to. I don't want to go to another one. And I was like, as as we were wrestling for with him, I'm like, calm down, man. I love you. So my friend manages to like disarm him, unload it. But before that happened, I had another friend come up from the stairwell. He was like. It was going on, him just thinking like, hey, we're just like wrestling for, just for fun. And I just turned to him and I, the only words I could utter was just gun. And he slams the door and he's out there just waiting. In case he gets out, he would just tackle him. But we managed to disarm him. And he, and I go find a team leader, right? Uh, this guy, this guy's different from my corporal, right? He, he takes the time to listen to what we have to say. He's a true leader, right? I love it, and I, I, I love him, and I will do anything for him. If he asks me, hey, I'm out here, I'm stranded, can you come get me? I was like, sure thing. I don't care if I'm tired, I'll go, we'll do anything for this man. Because of how much respect he has for all of us and how much he treats us like a human being. And so me and him are talking to my boy that had the gun. And I didn't see no remorse in his eyes when, it, when he looked at me and said, hey, I'm not going to say the exact words, but hey, you really like, um, um, trying to find a way to censor this. Um, um, you, you really blew it for me, right? After that, didn't say nothing. And I could see, like, by his, like, by the way he had his body, like, how angry he was. Because that's, that's how I looked, like, when I was mad. And we went, um, the team leader, like, he texted my team leader and my squad leader to, like, meet up in the same room. And basically when we got there... They, he thought that I, I did something wrong, right? Because um, they brought me in, you know, like me and Warden. So he thought, like, what did this guy do, you know? So we started explaining what just went down, right? And I remember I have, I have not felt nothing to like, nothing towards this man. And I said, and I looked at him in the eyes and I was like, I love both of you, man. 
I love you. I couldn't let this happen, you know? I've had my issues with you, but I, I wouldn't desire, like, nothing to harm you. And when I say that, that's when, like, the realization of what I did, did just, like, kind of hit me, and I started crying a bit. So after that, like, investigations happened, and ever since then, like, I, I, I did not feel anything. Like, I felt alone, even with Robert. Robert's my best friend, right? Like, we do everything together, and, and he said it was such, it felt so weird just being close to me and me not showing any emotion because he was like, you're a happy person, bro. You know, but I understand what you're going through right now. And basically, they had me talk to the officer who's the psychiatrist on base. And he, uh, and he was like, so have you had any other traumatic experiences in the past? And I was like, yeah. Right, and I started, and I listed off like a handful of things, and he just looked at me like, how, how are you alive? Like, and from there, they were like, okay, I know you got a hike coming up. Do you feel safe holding a rifle? I was like, yeah. Just because this happened doesn't mean I want to kill myself, right? And he was like, okay. After your hike tomorrow, I want to speak to you again, see how you're doing. I was like, okay. So I set up my appointment. And then at this point, I'm just like a body wandering around. Like, like I, I just did what I needed to do. No second thoughts. And just wandering like a zombie. And at some point, I looked at myself. Right? And I was like, this isn't me. I am not this person. Bro. I am not a, I no longer hold on to my guilt, and yet I'm doing it right now. I felt so guilty for what I did, even though everyone tells, everyone was over here saying you're a hero. I was like, I don't feel like that, man. I feel like I could have prevented it. He was my friend. I could have lost more people, but thank God nothing happened to them. But I started looking into myself, and I was like, I am not this person. I am not this person. And I just did a quick prayer, and I was like, Lord, this is not me. I, pr I pray for clarity and peace, and I cast my cares onto you. All these burdens that I, that I feel, they're not mine. All the things that happened in the past, I can't control them. I can't control what I did in the past. I can't control what happened to me. And I just want to be myself again. So after that, and went from me being like totally like uh, sad and feeling lost to just getting a kick of energy like I just got kicked in the face I know how it feels like that so after that it was like just a sudden mood change because I feel such a weight get lifted off my shoulders and it still forced me to do the hike right and then For the first time, this corporal, like, he has, he showed me respect. And he didn't, he didn't talk to me like I'm, like, I don't know anything. And Robert looks at me, and, because I had told him this, and I was like, why wouldn't he show you respect, bro? You just saved his life. 
that just, to, just for him to not yell at me. So, 10 miles into the hike, um, I'm already, like, we stop and rest for like 10 minutes and then our company commander comes to me, right? It's, it's pitch black. It's already like one in the morning at this point. And he comes looking for me. He's like, can not see where you at? And then I fell asleep, right? And then I instantly woke up and looked. And he came up to me and he was like, I'm proud of what you did. He, he knew that I wanted to go see the Oscars, so he asked me, how are you? And I kind of paused for a second. I was like, and I, told, and I looked at him, I was like, I'm doing way better than what I was a couple hours ago. And during the hike, there's this one song that I love to listen to, right? It's called Light. And, and one part of the lyrics is when he says, Sometimes darkness can show you the light. And that line just did not leave my head at all. I was like, this all happened, right? I finally learned how to cast my cares out. And that burden was lifted off of me. The hike ends, I go to sleep, finally. And the next day, on Friday, they were like, I want to see you again. I was like, okay. I go into their office, and then the Oscar looks at me, and we're talking. And he was like, you're the same person, right? I was like, yes, I am. Because there's, a, there's like a 180 difference between yesterday and today. starstruck just looking at me and and he was like what did you do and I just told him I just simply prayed to God you know cast my cares out and and I mentioned something and I was like all right I can use that you know so we've been wanting to do our reaching out in Camp Pendleton for a while the church has been wanting to do some sort of events out there. And when he mentioned these words, I was like, okay, I think about it, you know. He said, I want you to talk to the chaplain. Something big's coming. And I spoke to this to Pastor yesterday, and he was like, God has like a somewhat of an extreme way of showing you, of showing me how to do things. And I was like, yep. Makes it a, gives me a lot of good stories to tell. And I didn't find this out till yesterday. So around the same time where we were struggling to get the gun, all the way down the best city known in the world, Houston, right? My mom was praying for me. And God gave her like, just it just like put her, I mean, put me in her head and she just started praying for me. My dad was there, which was very weird because my dad's never home. And he said, your mom was just crying like she has never cried before. Just praying for protection and telling me to hold on a little bit longer. Let's worship God. Amen. Hallelujah. But David, would you come? I want you to testify what God's doing. Yeah. 
two Bible studies going on. You know, Brother Edwin, when he came Wednesday night, he had a bad back. And you pray for our Marines because they, they go through a lot, as you probably can tell. But he came Wednesday night and God healed him with his back. Just coming into the service as he keeps walking in his miracle in Jesus' name. Go ahead, Brother David, testify. In Jesus' name, God is good. God is good, and it is encouraging word to hear all these things. Uh, they're marvelous things that God is doing, and the things that we don't think that God's doing. Um, it's as most of you know, I'm a pastor in Buena Park, and God has been working with us. And for the longest time, uh, there was there's just thought of what are you doing? You're going over there. You're not really doing anything. Uh, not really much is happening in outreach. What are you doing? And it's just that thought that keeps nagging and nagging. But God put it upon my spirit that if we help that man, if we can just help him, God will take care of whatever will happen there. So I told God, okay, you've given me this talent. I'm going to use it for your kingdom. So I'm going to use and be a help to pastor any way I can be. I'm going to be that help to surrender what you want to be done in the city of Bonaparte. And as you may know, we, we prayed here. And the prayers that happen here aren't limited to time and space. So we've prayed for backsliders in this place that affected the city over there 30 minutes away. We've established a, now a weekly Bible study with a woman named Elsa who was a backslider who called us out of nowhere. I don't know how she got her information. I don't know where she found our information, but God directed us to her. And last Thursday, I was contemplating what to teach. I, I was praying on uh, whether I should teach Search for Truth or Exploring my father's house and I was trying to teach it but it wouldn't flow it wouldn't flow and God just told me because we've been preaching Bible or teaching Bible studies about baptism and God told me to ask one question and that was what doth hinder what doth hinder because we've been talking about baptism for the last couple weeks and it's just what is this what is this or it's because of this I don't I, I, I feel scared about this and when I ask that question see the enemy can be a little dumb sometimes and he spoke they spoke the exact things that they were going through that hinders them from being baptized they said it was fear they said it was this. They said it was that. So all this week, God has been praying through me to binding every fear, to binding every hindrance, to binding all these things. And I'm believing in faith this coming Thursday, we will hear from them on what and when they want to be baptized. I'm believing it in faith. We've heard many miracles, so I'm believing in faith. And for the last couple years, um, we've been praying for my in-laws. We've been praying for my in-laws, and we've had a couple Bible studies, and it's just one thing after another. We can't do it because of this. We can't do it because of this. Or when we had uh, Bible studies, it just turned into bickering and arguments about doctrine. and uh, So we kind of left it alone for a little bit, but we kept it in prayer. We kept it in prayer. And last Sunday we were just talking me and my father-in-law we work at the same spot and um, they haven't been going to church for a while and we were just talking and talking about work and the stress about work and I don't know the subject just changed all of a sudden and he said you know we haven't been going to church for a while um, I wanted to ask you how do you feel about giving us a one hour Bible study a week how do you feel about that? 
And I told him, absolutely, absolutely. God is getting to the point where they are, God is bringing those who are hungry to us. And when we become available, when we become and put ourselves in a situation that, God, I am not perfect. I myself make mistakes, but through your righteousness, through your love, you're going to operate through me. You just make yourself available and God will open up doors. So it's one thing after another, one thing after another. And God, it may not seem like he's doing anything yet, but the thing that God's been dealing me, with me is your prayers are not limited to time and space. You are praying for a specific time, the specific portion of time. And when that time is right, he will open that door. So believe in faith. Every prayer that you pray, is just ticking towards the time that God is about to release it. Every prayer you pray is a closer step to the miracle that's about to be opened, to the baptisms that's about to be opened, to the infillings of the Holy Ghost that God's about to be opened. So every time you pray, believe it in faith. It's just a ticking time towards the mark. We are pressing towards the mark that God is leading so every prayer that you pray, pray it in faith that we will see it one day. There is a harvest that is coming. There is a harvest. There is a great harvest that is promised to the church. And you are a part of it. So every prayer you've prayed is coming to fruition. In the name of Jesus, can we rejoice and worship God? great assurance in this place right now. You know, I don't want to I don't want to go too deep into what God wants me to say. But how many of us have a need in the house? Maybe it's a family member that still isn't saved, maybe it's an entire family that still needs to have an encounter with God. You know, as the progression of the service, I've been feeling out like, God, okay. I knew he was going to have me say something, but it was almost as if what Pastor was talking about and what Brother Edwin was talking about, what my brother talked about, it almost put everything together. And I'm reminded of that story in the Bible with Peter. And I believe it was Peter and Andrew that went out to go fishing because they needed to pay off a debt. They were fishing all night. They kept trying, and no fish was coming. There was nothing coming up. And they fished all night, almost to the point where it was the next morning, I believe so. Right, Pastor? And it just so happens to be that Jesus is on the shore, and he tells them, he shouts out to them and says, cast your net on the other side. And Peter, as bold as his character is, said, we've been fishing all night. We've been trying literally everything. Well, what, is, what is casting the net on the other side going to do? And I feel like that's where a lot of us are today. We've been trying so many things, and it's almost as if our walk with God is almost as if, like, we're not really seeing any results. But according to the story, Peter decided to obey God. And he casted his net to the other side. And because of his act of obedience and his trust, there was so much fish that went into that net. And it just so happened to be because back then they also paid off things fish was a currency back then and because of how much fish they had it paid off the debt that they had that they had to pay off and I feel like what the Lord is trying to tell us this morning is that we can't give up even though 
each and every day, it might seem like it's a drag, but God sees it as an act of faith. He sees it as each and every step you are taking daily. He's going to bring us at that point where he's going to test our faith. And he's going to say, cast your net to the other side now. And that's where a lot of us are at. We're not really seeing results. But you heard the story and the testimony of Brother Edwin. You heard the story of my brother and what he's going through. They were just on standby. And when it was the right time, God did the work. And now these people's lives are getting touched. And it was all God. But God was waiting for us to be obedient and to be on standby. I wonder if, if that ministers to you, I want you to come up to the front. You're, you're just waiting for something to happen. But God is trying to get you to realize that no, it is a walk. And there will come a time where God will start to pour out his miracle because that's exactly what happened on that day. They weren't expecting much anymore. They've tried everything. But because God gave them a direction, God gave them that direction of cast your net on the other side. It was a testing of faith. And because of that, they received that miracle. I wonder if we could just lift our hands in this place. I don't know how God is ministering to you specifically. But there are needs in this place. But God is saying, if you could just hold on for just a few more moments. If you could just hold on, your family is going to be saved. If you would just stick with the fight. If you would just keep walking with me. I will show you the reason why I had you struggle. I will show you the reason why I put you through this trial. I will show you the reason why. Come on, could you start to lift up your voice towards heaven? And would you start to align yourself with God right now? God, I am available. It might not seem fair right now, but God, I believe you are still working in my circumstance. I still believe that you are king. I still believe that you are going to provide for me. I still believe that you exist. I still believe that you're going to take care of me. Come on, someone ought to lift up your voice in this place. There's a great move of God in this place. Some of us are trying things and it doesn't seem like anything is working. But you just wait. God is ready to do something in your life that's going to be so profound. You're not going to be able to forget that day. And you're going to turn back and say, God, you have always been there for me. God, you have always been there for me. If you feel impressed to pray with someone, could you please do so right now? There are great needs in this place. There's great ministry when you can just submit to God. Maybe there's a there's a word that God is giving you to speak to someone right now. Could you be obedient to the word of God right now? There's great healing in this place. Here comes that assurance in the name of Jesus. Submit to it and just allow the Spirit of God. 
God to flow? Would you allow the Spirit of God to flow? Would you allow Him to touch you this morning? Lord is here. 